Hello, everyone. Uh, it looks like people are coming online here. Um, we'll get started here shortly. Uh, being our first webinar in a series of webinars for the International Palm Society, uh, we have to accept that there are some glitches. And then unfortunately, our, our presenter for this evening uh, went to get his slide presentation ready to go and the infinite wisdom of Apple decided to force an update on him. So he is somewhat delayed. Um, we'll go ahead and chat for a little bit here. And uh, he, he's letting me know how uh, delayed he will be. I may hit pause on the webinar uh, for five or 10 minutes just to give him time to get uh, fully back online and, and ready to present. But I guarantee you that uh, it's well worth the wait. Jason is a, uh, he's a good speaker. His photographs are absolutely phenomenal and the book is spectacular. Um, I still see people coming on. We're up to, uh, anyhow, I see, see participants logging in as, as we, we speak. Let me, let me start with a few, uh, just a little bit of background and uh, a preamble, if you will, and then we'll do a little bit of housekeeping, and then I'll, I'll give you Jason's background as we get started here. But um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Robert Blenker. I'm a director of the International Palm Society based here in Southwest Florida. Also a uh, proud member of the Central Florida Palm and Psychiatric Society, a little plug for, for our local group. Um, as you know, the, the, Palm, the IPS's motto is conserve, learn, and grow. We have members on all continents except Antarctica, although I should say that one of our members was stationed there at a research station temporarily. So at one point we could say we had members on all continents. Um, and this is the first and what we hope is a dynamic series of uh, presentations. It's been several years in the making. Uh, we've been waiting for technology to catch up and the unfortunate circumstances of COVID-19, its impact around the region, uh, its negative impact on this year's biennial meeting had the perverse positive uh, effect of making various forms of webinar software such as Zoom and WebEx ubiquitous and easily accessed. So I guess there's a slight silver lining in what has been a difficult situation for many around the world. Um, as I said, I hope this is the first of many such webinars. Uh, in the pipeline, we've got things like uh, Paul Kraft's Palms of Cuba. Any of you who have uh, traveled to Cuba and seen the, the diverse and dynamic palm environment there, uh, this is one that's definitely worth seeing. Uh, we have spoken with Dr. Uh, Rodrigo Bernal uh, to present the, uh, his presentation on the diverse palms of Colombia. It's a fantastic presentation. Um, we have John Dransfield in the uh, mysterious world of rattans. And then other themes we're working on are things like uh, the, the use of palms around the world. We have a couple of dynamic speakers on that topic. It's, it's amazing how much diversity there is in the, the utilization of palms, both for commercial and agricultural purposes. And then we're also uh, working on finding the most appropriate way to present the uh, cutting edge research being conducted by um, IP, IPS research grantees um, around the world. It's really fantastic, interesting and dynamic stuff. Um, We've endeavored to pick a time that works for everybody, um, as broad a segment of our membership as possible. Uh, to wit, I'm kind of looking at registrations here and people are signing in. I see registrants from Spain and Peru, Colombia, Brazil. Let's see, we've got Puerto Rico and Mexico. Uh, I see somebody from Crimea. We've got California, Texas, and Florida. I see a few from Hawaii, Australia, and New Zealand. And I think we even have someone from uh, Madagascar. You know, sadly, it's not always possible to accommodate all time zones without at least somebody having to uh, participate in a very uncomfortable wee hour of the morning. So with that in mind, uh, we'll be recording this event. It will be available on the uh, IPS website. Uh, not sure how quickly we can get that up since this is the first time we're doing this, but I suspect it will be up, uh, you know, by early next week. Uh, it'll be um, broadcast. You'll, there'll be a link to our YouTube channel. Um, and to view recordings of the webinar, and then more importantly, to renew or, or join the International Palm Society, please visit us at 
www.palms.org. Um, a few housekeeping items, and I'll, uh, as soon as I see Jason is ready to go here, I'll cut this short, but uh, he's still waiting for his computer, it appears. Um, so housekeeping, the presentation will last about 45 to 50 minutes. We'll take 10 minutes of official questions at the end of the presentation. However, for those with a bit more time, Jason has graciously uh, offered to extend and continue to answer questions as they come up. To ask questions, um, if you look at the bottom part of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Please use that uh, to ask your questions. All registrants will be able to see them and uh, Jason will read the question and then respond to it as, uh, uh, as we go forward. Well, actually at the end of the presentation. Um, now in my perfect world, as soon as uh, Jason's teed up and ready to go, I will disappear and you will have the main screen will be Jason's uh, slide deck and fantastic photos and you'll see him in a little square up on the corner. You can also minimize Jason so he kind of disappears and you just have the full screen of his phenomenal pictures. I suggest also that you um, uh, try to set your screen to the highest resolution possible because once again these photos are pretty spectacular. Um, Let's see. Oh, there's a Q&A already. Let me see if that's for me. <laughs> oh, we've got Morocco on too as well. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, so let's see. Um, also, if you notice any technical problems, please let me know via the Q&A function and I'll endeavor to fix them. Remember, your guinea pigs, as is Jason, this is the first and what I hope is a a, d a dynamic and productive series of presentations that'll truly showcase the international nature of IPS. And uh, uh, thank goodness we have this technology available to us. All right, everybody, uh, once again, thank you for your indulgence. It looks like we're uh, up and running. There's always a technical glitch. Uh, if there weren't, who would we be? <laughs> and I, I appreciate the, uh, the words of encouragement from around the world uh, of those who have gone through the same thing with their uh, their uh, company WebExes as well. So Jason's with us. Let me uh, introduce you to tonight's speaker, uh, Jason Dewey, horticulturalist, botanist, designer, and most importantly, IPS member um, for many years. Uh, Jason's 2018 book from Timber Press, uh, Designing with Palms earned the American Horticultural Society's 2019 Book Award. He's spoken at the Huntington Botanical Gardens, UC Berkeley Botanical Gardens, uh, the Miami Beach Botanical Gardens, Flamingo Gardens, and, and numerous uh, horticultural groups, including the uh, Central Florida Palm and Cycad Society and the Hawaii Island Palm Society. Um, as I said, a member of the International Palm Society Northern California chapter since he was a teenager which I think was last year, but anyhow, <laughs> um, in the 1980s, he says, Jason works as a horticulturalist at Flora Grub Gardens in San Francisco and Grub and Nadler Nurseries in uh, Fallbrook, California. He serves as a horticultural advisor to, the, to clients ranging from San Francisco Botanical Gardens and Conservatory of Flowers to landscape architects and home gardeners. Um, and I would remind everybody that his, uh, his book, Designing with Palms, is available on uh, Amazon as well as uh, book. I think it's bookshop.com and uh, your your nearby uh, bookshops as well. Um, without further delay, I'll turn the screen over to Jason and remind everyone to set your screens to the best possible resolution. The photos are spectacular, and uh, use Q and A function. We will uh, will answer those towards the end. Take it away, Jason. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Robert, and thank you for everyone's patience um, with this mishap on my computer. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I'm very much looking forward to presenting the slideshow. I'm um, showing it out of uh, the iCloud, so right now it looks like it's doing a little download, unfortunately. Um, so again, there's a little bit of a delay, and I'm not sure how else to do it. So. Um, Sorry about that. The book uh, arose out of um, my experience working at Flora Grub Gardens. I began there partly because of 
my palm expertise. Um, the nursery was started in 2003 by Flora Grubb and her business partner, Saul Nadler. And knowing about my palm expertise, they uh, invited me to work with them. And eventually I agreed to it. Um, and in 2007, I joined them. And as I was working with them, I, I, real, I realized that um, there was a real need in my area, in the San Francisco Bay Area of California, for um, a book that addressed how to use palms in garden design and in the landscape. There are lots of fantastic books that are encyclopedias of palm species and that show individual palm species. Um, and there was nothing for people to kind of understand the different functions that palms can uh, have in a landscape and the different roles that they can play in a garden. Um, and in many, many conversations with garden designers and homeowners, I was uh, helping them understand these palms that we were selling. We started out as a palm broker in San Francisco and brought up, used to bring up um, palms from Southern California for landscapers and uh, homeowners. And so there was always this uh, variety of palms that no other nursery had in San Francisco um, and few else in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area offered. Uh, so it was a very exciting opportunity and, um, and I was able to invite Caitlin Atkinson to uh, join me in producing this book, Designing with Palms with Timber Press. Caitlin's photographs are very beautiful and I hope that you will enjoy them. Um, so that's the origin of the book. And I think for, for us palm fanatics, um, thinking about design in our, in our gardens and, and also just out in other landscapes is, is very uh, fruitful. We can, we can enjoy our palms better if we design our gar gardens in ways that enhance their beauty and uh, take advantage of their function. So the first slide I'm presenting is of coconut at Pukina in the lower keys of Florida which I'm sure many people participating in the webinar have been to. Um, I suspect it's not in as good a shape now after hurricane damage as it was when we photographed it in 2015. But uh, the coconut palm is the iconic palm. It's one that any five-year-old can, can draw. And it's something that a lot of us in northern latitudes or very far southern latitudes um, think of as the symbol of a relaxing tropical vacation. And of course, for people who actually live in the tropics, it's also an incredibly functional and useful plant for food and for shelter and for craft. Um, and without it, people could never have even settled and, and survived on the aptitudes of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Um, so it has different roles in, in different places and for different people, but everybody recognizes a palm tree. Everybody recognizes a coconut palm as a palm tree. It's an iconic form. Um, and for those of us in California, I think for, for other places, uh, especially outside the tropics, that iconic figure of the palm tree, maybe it's a date palm, maybe it's a coconut, um, can get in the way of actually looking at the diversity of palm family that most of us are very familiar with being lovers of palms. Um, we know that palms can be little tiny understory plants that mingle beautifully with ferns on the, on the ground level, or perhaps they're rattan that's climbing up deep, deep into the jungle foliage above. Um, or maybe it's a shrub in the Mediterranean scrub of Spain. Um, palms take on many different forms. It's an incredibly diverse family, and so they can do a lot of different things in the landscape. That examination of palm for their and for their uh, benefits is uh, really important for people to take on, to, for people to focus their eyes on palms and really look at cells and understand what they're looking at too, so they use them better. Um, and this is true for us, um, we, we palm people. So here I, I'm presenting a, a photograph of a painting by Edith Bergstrom, who is a longtime Northern California Palm Society member who gardens on two acres near uh, Stanford University down in the Silicon Valley area. Um, it's a garden with more than 100 species of palms and it's in a climate that can sometimes reach as low as zero or uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so she's had tremendous success with a lot of different palm species. Um, but here we're looking at 
at the painting that she did um, of desert fan palms down in the desert, low desert areas of, of California. And what I love about this painting is that it shows us quite clearly a palm, and actually more than one palm, but it, it really focuses on the process of decay in the crown of the leaves, of those leaves that have finished their, their photosynthesizing career and, and are dying, dying down. Um, and then showing us those background palms, the vibrant green. Um, her, her painting career has encompassed a lot of paintings of palms and of landscapes. Um, she's just loved the subject for decades and decades, and she's, she's a, a noted artist. She's also um, a noted gardener, so there'll be more photos. For, uh, so when we, when we think of palms, um, obviously we divide the family into feather and fan. That's a morphological distinct, isn't completely matched in uh, the, the, um, the genetics. But uh, on the left, of course, Bismarckia nobilis, one of our celebrated Madagascar species. On the right, uh, a Beccaria phoenix, I believe Fenestralis. This photograph is shot at Halu which is a garden in the Pune district of the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, this garden was designed by David Stalbach, who uh, is partially in residence there and partially in San Francisco. Davis is one of my palm mentors. When I was 17 years old, I learned a lot about palms from him. Um, and I think there are a couple of things to talk about in terms of design here. We're looking at a really dense, jungly planting. Uh, lots of different kinds of foliage. Um, we have tea plants, we have anthuriums. Um, and we have palms, and it's the palms that obviously draw our, our eye. It's that incredible power of the fans of the Bismarckia, the silver color as well. Um, and then the sort of languid, uh, relaxed movement of the Beccaria Phoenix on the right is a completely different feeling, but nonetheless uh, also it has so much energy that the, the foliage impact of palms uh, of, of both these types is unsurpassed. And, my friend Roger Raish, who is a horticulturist and a garden designer in the wine country of California, describes palms as being the superlative foliage plant. And of course, we know that palms have the largest leaf in the, in the plant kingdom, um, so it, it's befitting that they be the most, the, the superlative foliage plant. But besides foliage in this photograph, we're also looking at trunks of palms, and we're not paying attention to them as much. They're not drawing our eye. What they're doing is structuring the scene. They're giving us a way of kind of parsing through this dense foliage, and it's, I think, all the more pleasing for their presence. It's those vertical lines that divide up this otherwise kind of um, cacophonous assortment of plants and makes it much more pleasing. And it's true in real life as well. I've spent many a many a day at Hale Mahalu wandering around and enjoying um, the designs that, that uh, David Stalbach did on his property. Palms have a particular affinity for um, strong architecture and uh, numerous points in the presentation, I'll, I'll show uh, examples of that. Here, we're looking at two specimens of Jubea chilensis in San Francisco, in Golden Gate Park, next to a museum called the De Young Museum, designed by the architects Herzog and de Mern. Um, it's hard to think of any other plant could, that could really hold up to this enormous, uh, quite dramatic modern building. And I think it's not just that the palms are iconic in their form, but I think it's also that the, the way in which the light passes through the leaves, particularly on the left of the two palm trees, um, resembles the way the light passes through the screening on the tower in the distance. Um, and then at the same time, there's parallelism in the leaves um, that, is, that is also matched to some extent by the rigid rectangular parallelism in the building itself. And then of course, the pattern of the trunks, the surface of the trunks, uh, ha it sort of echoes the, uh, the patterning of the copper cladding on the De Young Museum building. In the course of uh, producing the book, Caitlin and I traveled to 70, more than 70 different gardens and landscapes and native habitats, uh, including Bullis Bromeliad's display garden in the Redlands area of Miami-Dade County, Florida. Um, Patricia Bullis has created an extremely beautiful garden there. 
uh, as a way of uh, showing off the bromeliads that her company, Bellis Bromeliads, produces by the thousands. Um, they are one of the largest producers of bromeliads in, uh, in the United States. And she was generous enough to allow us to photograph the garden before it was completed, but I do recommend if you are at all in the, in the trade or if you have any chance to visit um, to do so because the garden is quite beautiful. She cut into the native limestone there um, and allowed the groundwater to fill the, the um, basin that, that she excavated uh, and then used that excavated limestone to create a sort of platform surrounding the water feature. And of course, she also created uh, waterfall-like fountains um, falling off the, the edge of, of that platform. What's interesting in this photograph is that she used a clumping hybrid phoenix as the focal point of uh, this terrace next to the water feature. And then she placed sable palmettos recently planted here in 2015 um, to emphasize the height of the platform, but also to lean in over the water to make uh, for more of an enclosure. She also planted a grove of poinciana trees uh, or flamboyans, the Lonyx regia, surrounding it. So you can imagine in early summer, uh, the bloom, the, the vermilion flowers all over these trees. Um, the palms played an important role in this garden, helping her show her customers um, how to use the bromeliads that she sells and just to feature their different qualities. So here again at Ballas Bromeliads, we're looking um, down an axis uh, along the platform. It looks almost like a Mayan ruin. Um, and she's placed these beautiful uh, Alcantarea odorata, the silvery vermiliads in the foreground with some neoregilias contrasting in their own vermilion color, which will um, obviously be echoed in the crowns of those Delonyx regia trees. And she has a phoenix, a clumping phoenix to the right, leaning in almost like a, a welcoming uh, host to the party. And then if you look far in the distance down the axis, you can see a row of royal palms on the horizon. So in this flat landscape of South Florida, uh, creating vertical, um, vertical uh, dimension is, is important. And it's, an, it's a helpful, I think, thing to, to have palm trees lining a road out in the countryside to help you orient yourself and to help you keep track of your progress through the landscape. Um, and of course, all you have to do is go up a few feet in elevation to catch a little bit better of a view. And that's what she created here. You can see on the left, a bit closer up on that clump of the hybrid phoenix. I suspect it's a Robolenii by Recnata or vice versa. Uh, and then some of the beautiful bromeliads that she has planted around. Um, another thing that palms excel at is uh, reflections in water. I'm not sure there's any other plant that's quite so exquisitely beautiful than palms reflected in water. On the right, uh, the, the use of sable palmetto boots or leaf bases as a host for bromeliads. Um, of course, also for ferns and orchids and, and other epiphytes. Um, many palm species can be really excellent epiphyte hosts. So another thing that we discovered uh, as we traveled through South Florida is how beautiful the skies are. And this is something I'm familiar with because I um, used to visit South Florida a lot as a kid. Uh, my grandparents lived in South Miami in the uh, Pinecrest Kennel area. And um, I recall during the warmer part of the year, the clouds above Miami were so dramatic and so beautiful. Nothing I was used to from California where I grew up. Um, and, and palms can draw the eye upward toward that skyscape that is really unparalleled in my experience. There's just such beauty up in the sky. Um, and here at Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden, uh, Raymond Jungles designed this planting with these graduated rosettes rising up toward the, the final rosettes of the, of the Bismarckias with that tremendous energy, almost like a, a strobe light photograph of an explosion catching it just at its beginning. Um, that frozen energy sort of radiating outward is, is hard to miss, hard to keep your eyes off. And then with the, with the trunking trees rising up above, it, again, it draws your eyes upward. 
But I love how jungles use these simple bromeliad rosettes in the foreground and then the more complex cycad rosettes in the midground, uh, the encephalardos, and it uh, looks like there might be some diwans here too. Um, it's, it's just a, a beautiful planting, it, and it really speaks to the functions that palms can have in a flat landscape, um, which are, you know, common landscapes, even in California, we do see those lines of palm trees out in the Central Valley, for example, um, doing that work. On the left, again, uh, at Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden, the Bismarckia above a bed of bromeliads and, and cycads, um, and then a hint of, of that cloudscape up above. Um, and if, not to despair, but if you compare the trees in the background, they're not necessarily drawing your eye up in the same way. They, they're more of a, a background or a screen. Um, so I, that's how I, I make that argument. Um, <clears throat> On the right in the Puna Coast, um, which is uh, the Big Island of Hawaii, coconuts growing up from the, the La Rock, um, also drawing your eye upward. But in Hawaii, um, especially on some of the older islands like Kauai and Oahu and um, Maui, there are mountains to see as well. So those coconut palms sometimes draw your eyes up toward Mauna Kea, which is the uh, sometimes snow-capped volcanic peak of um, the Big Island or perhaps to the beautiful fluted cliffs on the shore of Kauai. Um, so again, that, that function can work in any location. It doesn't have to be a flat location. Here in the mountainous uh, California foothills or, or uh, valley, uh, this is the Huntington Botanical Garden, and this is an alley of Livestone Australis directing view from the, the Huntington's home directly toward the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, and this too is a, a fantastic function for palms. There's probably no other plant that makes for a better alley uh, than palms. This also is a sort of a, a representation of a historical style. The, the garden and the uh, house were developed starting in the 19 teens. Um, and they represent a, a period of, um, exploration and uh, bringing home exotic plants and trees and and the botanical garden was was founded during that era as a private garden um, by Mr. Huntington and Mrs. Huntington. So that vertical function can also be very important in very small spaces. On the right we're looking at a courtyard garden in San Francisco's Mission District in California. Um, this is a very urban area and this garden brought in, the gardener uh, brought in full-size Washingtonia robustas, Mexican fan palms. And without those trees, I think this space wouldn't feel nearly as welcoming, nearly as pleasant. Um, it might feel a little bit walled in and confined, but what we see here is the beautiful green crowns of, of the Washingtonias, uh, adding some interest up above and also a kind of comforting canopy. In addition to that, of course, as the wind blows, the leaves will make a rustling sound, which is a very pleasing and comforting sound as you spend time out on the patio. Another aspect of this design by Christopher Reynolds is the use of color. Um, it's uncanny that the freshly pruned trunks of these Washingtonias have a, a reddish tone uh, that matches the Ipe fence in the background. And both of those will fade at about the same rate to a more silvery gray tone. On the left, um, a subtle example of how beautiful palm foliage can be through a window, in this case, a translucent rather than transparent window. Um, the other Camadoria pomosa on the far side of that, of that window. The same garden from a different perspective up above, we look out at the crowns and that's again, a very pleasing effect and what isn't visible in the photograph, but is in that apartment, is other crowns in the neighborhood of other Washingtonia robustas. So in this dense kind of urban jungle, the concrete jungle of San Francisco's Mission District, um, there is a little bit of a connection between this private garden and some of the public uh, street tree plantings nearby. It makes for a friendlier, um, more lively environment. Crap can also function in ways unexpected, because we all know, at a young, you've got to make for it as, as a rosette. 
before it rises upward. This sable urana from the Sonoran Desert in Mexico, um, this is a very large crown. <laughs> this is Edith Bergstrom's garden, again, down by Stanford um, in the Silicon Valley area of California. Uh, it might look like this is an obstacle, but in fact, this functions almost as garden architecture. This is almost a, um, a vegetable gazebo. And it's a really cool experience to walk along that trail and just hang out underneath that, that palm crown. Um, the petioles are so long and the, the leaves are so big that it's actually um, a very experience under this rosette phase palm tree. Naturally, it will gradually rise up and, and become a more traditional palm tree shape. So in California, we are uh, blessed to have our own native species, the desert fan palm, Washingtonia filifera, photographed in habitat on the left at what's called the Indian Canyons area next to Palm Springs. Um, in the middle, we are looking at a hybrid between the Mexican fan palm Washingtonia robusta and that Washingtonia filifera, that pair of palm trees is Washingtonia filesta. And then of course in the distance in this garden at, in the center image by Steve Martino, a line of Washingtonia robusta. Steve Martino's garden in the center uh, is also in Palm Springs and on the side of that garden he, uh, he redid this garden that already had about 83 Washingtonia filiferos. Steve Martino is based in uh, Arizona, and he tends to use local native desert plants in his designs. His theme is weeds and walls. In other words, plants that people don't necessarily regard very highly, um, that he brings into the garden and allows to be appreciated because of the construction and the color that he brings into the landscape. Um, here in Palm Springs, because the palms are native, he was able to use those to great effect in this garden in Palm Springs. Uh, the rightmost image is Tongva Park, which is essentially the, the central square of Santa Monica, California, which is embedded in Los Angeles, uh, right by the ocean. Um, this is a park designed by James Corner Field Operations, a landscape architecture firm also responsible for the design of the High Line in New York City, the famous elevated park walkway uh, down in the um, Chelsea district of Manhattan. Um, this is a fantastic park, very large, with a baseline design of a meadow, but with lots of different sorts of plants embedded in uh, that theme of, of meadow grasses, including palms. Uh, and in this photograph on the right, you can see Mediterranean fan palms, you can see young Livestona australis, uh, the cabbage tree. You can see a Budia odorata, and of course the Washingtonias and the Phoenix canariensis, so, so well known in the California landscape. Close up on Tongva Park's plantings, a silver Mediterranean fan palm from the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and Algeria, Camerops humilis variety argentia. And then again, that little fringe of Livestona australis off uh, in the upper edge of the image, along with a philodendron and um, some other uh, plantings amidst the grasses. That combination of the stiff uh, fan leaves, the beautiful of the palm, the, the soft um, movement of the grass is particularly pleasing. And it's something that Caitlin, the photographer who created these images, um, discussed with me that I hadn't really thought about as much and um, I, I grew to love that, that combination of grasses and palms together. Here at the Huntington Botanical Garden in a new entrance garden, um, not just a stone's throw from that, that alley that I showed you earlier, uh, is a grove of Brahea clara, uh, from, also from the Sonoran Desert. These are from original collections of seed and habitat um, by some of the horticulturists and botanists at the Huntington back in the 70s. Um, when they were designing this, they were able to use these that had been planted uh, in, a, in a sort of undisclosed part of the garden, an area not open to the public. And they brought them in to uh, this, this meadow-like planting and, and created essentially a savanna type uh, garden. Um, I think it's a fantastic combination. And 
when Caitlin and I were photographed in Florida, we were lucky enough to cross Miami Naples on the Tamiami Trail. And as you get closer to Naples, you pass through an area with hundreds of thousands of palmettos growing above the, the river of grass. And, and that was the first place I'd ever seen um, a palm savanna in real life. Um, so this is a rather different one, of course. This is a much drier context, um, but it works just as well, I think. And then, of course, we have a little uh, Budia odorata in the foreground, and then in the distance, Washingtonia robusta. Uh, that big tree coming up there is um, Agathis uh, robusta, the Queensland cowrie tree, a conifer, tropical conifer. One of the things that I discovered in Florida was the view of some, some gravel in a, in a landscape that's otherwise dominated by greenery um, and using that gravel to showcase a collection. And so here, this collection of Cocothrinac species, most of them or many of them native to Florida, um, and also I guess there's a, a Leucothrinax there, um, I think is really, really pleasing because most of what you're experiencing at Fairchild is, is quite green and having a little breathing room like this um, I think is, is a nice change of pace and it also features the plants. It allows you to really get the details on, the, on these uh, Cocothrinax and, and Leucothrinax. And then in the distance this really interesting planting of Livestona chinensis. Um, as far as I can tell from the photo and I don't remember from being there, they planted in two angles. The, the the front row uh, leans in and then the back row grows straight up. Um, I would love to be corrected if that's not exactly how it is in real life. But nonetheless, the lean in is, is uh, particularly pleasing. This is one side of the main axis at uh, Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden. So when I'm talking with palm novices about using palms in design, I also want to convey to palm novices that palms are really important parts of the ecosystems in which they grow. And that's true as much in our gardens as it is in their own habitat. So on the left, we're looking at the inflorescence of a sable pumos in Edith Bergstrom's garden, being, uh, being pollinated by and serving uh, the nectar and pollen needs of a honeybee. Um, on the right, we're looking at the desert fan palm at the Thousand Palms Oasis near Palm Springs, where uh, a garland of ripe fruit hangs down, um, ripe for the picking. Wherever palms grow, people use them. And in, in the, this is just as true in the deserts of California as it is anywhere else in the world, in the Amazon or in um, Hawaii or wherever in Indonesia. Um, so these are tasty fruits, um, little tiny sweet currant-like fruits with very large seeds uh, proportionally to the fruit. Uh, those seeds can be used for flour. Um, the plants themselves are used for uh, shoes, for thatch, um, lots of different uses. And then of course the wildlife make tremendous use of, of the desert fan palm. Uh, they eat the fruit, the, the seeds, they, uh, for example, coyotes or uh, foxes, um, birds eat the fruits and seeds, and birds like the hooded oriole use the fronds to make their hanging nests. A phenomenon we see up here in Northern California as well on ornamental Washingtonias. This is a slide that I tend to show to the novices just to let them know how to identify a palm that, you know, a palm is always going to have a folded complex leaf, whether a fan or a feather shape, uh, or let's say an unfolded leaf. And so a yucca, not a complex leaf, not, not unfolded uh, in the left image, that blue sprout in the middle, uh, a yucca rostrata. And on the right, uh, a cycas titungensis um, in Augusta, Georgia, unfurling its, uh, its new flush of leaves, clearly not a palm because of that funk, the way that the leaves are developing, they're not unfolding and they're, they're coming out all in a big flush. So that's a cycad. That unfolded, I think, the key to the, the attraction of palms. Um, on the left, two different Ceroxylon species at the Oakland Palmetum uh, near San Francisco uh, Ceroxylon alpinum in the foreground and Ceroxylon kinduense in the background. And then 
um, on, you can see that unfolding process on the left um, where the spear is uh, right and then the tallest down there on the is in the unfold spear. On the right, we have these entire leaves of Liquala in the foreground and of Amaro Jejia in the background. Um, on the right, the photograph comes from Hale Mahalo, Davis Dalbox Garden in Puna, Hawaii. Again, some unfolding underway on the left. Um, that's a Ceroxylon uh, parva fronds, the palm that grows at the highest altitude of all palms in the San Francisco Botanical Garden which has a nearly complete collection of the genus Ceroxylon at this point. Uh, and then Trachycarpus princeps, um, again, the beauty of those folds, the, the divisions in the leaf, um, the radial energy. Uh, the San Francisco Botanical Garden where this is growing also has a complete uh, collection of known Trachycarpus species at this stage, except for one, I think, the newest one. So another thing that's really important to pay attention to when choosing palm species for the landscape, what, what do the leaf bases look like and, and how do they connect to the trunk? For some people, the really complex um, architecture of leaf bases can be a very pleasing aspect of a palm tree and for others it can look messy or uh, not very appealing. So that's also important, especially if you're designing for someone else. Um, on the left, the Nikau palm, Ropalostylus sapita from New Zealand, um, with its crown shaft, its fat little crown shaft, and then subtended by a ripening fruit cluster on the right, and then a budded inflorescence right in the center there. Um, but that, that sort of clean look is, is very appealing to a lot of people, the, the crown shaft palm. And for us in San Francisco, there are very few that actually thrive, and this is one of them. Um, in the middle, a, a corypha species um, at a garden in the Lower Keys, uh, tended by design source. Um, and that split, that beautiful symmetrical upside down V at the base of the petiole as the, as the leaf base spreads out um, is a really interesting and uh, to my eye, very pleasing pattern, also known quite well on the sable genus. And on the right in Dick Douglas's garden in Walnut Creek, California in the Bay Area, the stubs of leaf bases on a um, Butia yate. Um, again, that, that pattern is, uh, is a really, I think, very interesting pattern. To me, it looks almost archeological. It has this ancient quality to it. The roots of palms are also an important aspect of a perform a lands. Uh, on the left, Douglas's of Washington's um, we actually believe one of them is actually a Washingtonia filifera and the other two are Washingtonia robusta. Uh, it indicates how closely you can plant palms to each other in many cases, not in all cases, um, and how those root masses interlock with each other. Uh, and again, that creates a, an interesting pattern and texture for people to uh, experience in the garden. Um, in the middle at La Casa de las Palmas, a pair of Socratea interlocking their um, stilt roots. This is absolutely fascinating. When I discovered this, I asked Caitlin to take the photo, but at that point it was overcast. It was, it was late in the um, afternoon and there was very little light, but she managed to get this photograph. I'm gonna pause for a second to close the window so that this loud sound doesn't bother us. Okay, I'm back. Um, and then on the right, a, an endangered um, cryosophila, uh, I believe it's Williamsii at the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden with its pattern of roots as spines growing out of the stem. Um, it's a great example of adventitious rooting, which is how palms root. They root off the stem, off the base of the stem in most cases, although in this case, all up along the stem. Comes as a surprise for a lot of people that there are some palms that branch above ground. And of course, uh, Hyphaene is the most famous genus that does this. Uh, the photograph on the left is a Hyphaene at 
Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden. But that singular form on the right is the classic palm tree form that people seek. This is a Livestona australis, again, at the Huntington Botanical Gardens. There's really no better vertical element. And I, I know I can say it a hundred times, but um, the way that that vertical element activates the volume around it is, um, it's hard to beat. It really turns the, the space up above into part of the garden. So some of the functions that people don't think about, I think even we Palm Society people don't think about so much, uh, include ground cover. Oops. Um, so a uh, clump of Cadoria stolonifera at uh, Lotus Land in uh, Santa Barbara, California, forms a sort of hip high ground cover for this area. Uh, and then shrub and bamboo type uh, functions in the landscape can be fulfilled by some of the Camadorias and many, many other palm species in genera like Rapis. Uh, so on the right, we have Camadoria Costa Ricana intermingled with a tree fuchsia at the San Francisco Botanical Garden. And of course, the climbing palms, um, we don't use them much in our landscapes because they are so fiercely armed. Um, but they do offer some curious interest, especially as young plants, I think, when you can really look up close at the, at the spines. This is Plecticomia himalayana, um, the higher altitude Plecticomia from the Himalayas. Um, and you can see it climbing up around on the left and then a close-up on the spines on the right. Again, these, um, these functions of bamboo and hedge uh, this is Camadoria microspadics in a garden designed by Davis Dalbach in San Francisco. Um, down at the bottom, we're looking, if you look closely, you can see Camadoria metallica, young clusters planted at the base of the mirror. And I think it's a, it's a really kind of a witty planting because of course the metallica has a, a shiny, almost reflective leaf surface and, and there it is beneath the mirror. In addition, it's, it's a really uh, happy companion to some of the other small herbaceous plantings down there in the lower ground level of this relatively shaded garden. It comes as a surprise to some people to see autumn foliage uh, in association with native palms. Uh, but here again, near Palm Springs, we see Washingtonia filifera growing in habitat in December uh, with trees that naturally lose their leaves in the late fall um, and drop them. And so these deciduous trees include the California sycamore on the right, and then we have a cottonwood or a populus species in the center, and willow species as well. So part of the goal of the book is to expand people's ideas about what's, what's okay to plant with palms. Uh, because palms grow in so many different kinds of habitats, um, I think it's great to use them in lots of different garden settings. And uh, I don't think we should be shy about using them with winter deciduous trees um, where appropriate. And uh, this example does surprise some people because a lot of Californians think of palms as exclusively tropical plants or as plants that signify you know, a tropical atmosphere or maybe a, maybe a desert oasis atmosphere. But this is indeed a desert oasis, but it's also a... Uh, you know, semi-deciduous riparian woodland. So that's the, that, that slide uh, showed the palm that's native to the state of California. And this slide I'm showing you Brahea edulis, which is a palm from Guadalupe Island, um, west of Baja, California. It's about 200 miles from San Diego, California, out in the Pacific Ocean. It's the westernmost bit of Mexico, and it's a biosphere reserve. Um, this palm actually is better suited to a lot of coastal California than our native fan palm. Um, and this is a really a beautiful planting of it at Lotus Land, uh, Ganaval Lotus Land, one of California's premier public gardens um, near Santa Barbara, California. Um, it's a palm that will tolerate our Mediterranean climate. In fact, it basically requires it. Um, it's, it doesn't do well with hot, wet summer conditions. Um, prefers cooler winters and drier summers. Um, tolerates really beautifully. It doesn't get terribly tall and uh, it, it plays well in a, in a small residential garden. 
And it's a good companion to California native plants. Uh, in Habitat, it grows with a lot of the plants that we Californians are familiar with from our native landscapes, both planted and wild. That combination of native and exotic or exotic looking and truly native um, is achieved in an unparalleled way at the Naples Botanical Garden on the west coast of South Florida. Um, the garden is embedded in a larger area of restored native habitat shown here in the distance, the slash pines, the palmettos, and the saw palmettos. In the foreground, the native uh, Flo Florida royal palm, uh, Roystonia regia, uh, planted in, in greater density because we're closer to the heart of this garden, which is highly structured, exotic, and very uh, botanical garden-esque. Um, it's a really beautiful integration of a, a, an exotic botanical garden and a native habitat and it's something for us, I think, as um, palm people to think about when we are considering how our, our garden relates to our neighborhood, how it relates to the natural habitats around us. Um, are we taking care of those natural habitats by our, our places? Um, are we taking advantage of borrowed views? Um, there's, I think it's a really interesting question. How, how does our garden integrate with our neighbors? Maybe we hand over the fence some of our favorite durable palms uh, to incorporate some of some of our favorites into their distant view and then maybe something that that they grow that we like we can incorporate it into our own. Again surprising to Californians eyes and, and maybe even to other people's eyes uh, the combinations of sable palmetto with the um, southern live oak Quercus virginiana in the right image and with uh, loblolly pine and Virginia creeper in the left image. This is in South Carolina at Kiowa Island, which is near uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, this, is, this is the state tree of the state of South Carolina, as well as the state tree of Florida. Um, and this is how they naturally grow in habitat. And so pines and palms and pines and oaks are a perfectly suited combination. In fact, that Guadalupe palm I showed you earlier grows in its island habitat with native pines and native oaks as well. In Charleston, I was really pleased to see that the use of palms is, is rather nonchalant and, and palms are not treated as necessarily an icon of a getaway or a tropical vacation, but as part of a, a natural palette. Um, I loved this planting because uh, the middle of Charleston is a very historic district. This is a federal style house. Um, meaning it's either from the, the early part of the 19th century or it's mimicking a house from that early period. Um, so it's very historic in appearance uh, and it incorporates a traditional boxwood hedge in the foreground and then the riotous energy of the native saw palmetto behind it with the more formal um, energy of the Chinese windmill palm of the Gertrigi cartoonii. Um, this combination of formal and energetic uh, succeeds beautifully in this basically public planting. It's right along the sidewalk. We discovered a garden in the middle of Charleston, um, poking our noses over a beautiful brick wall to see into this exquisitely designed garden by Robert Chestnut. Uh, we saw these pindo palms, Udia odorata, occupying the corners of garden rooms. There were several of these rectangular garden rooms. Um, in the left image, what I really like is how Robert Chestnut chose jets that, that flow into the pool that, whose arch mimics the arch of the Budia odorata leaves. He was able to source matched heights and matched colors on, on these Budias, which is quite a feat. Um, Otherwise, the plant palette in this garden is rather traditional uh, to my eye. Boxwoods, iceberg roses, uh, trachea spermum, jasmine, and southern magnolias and podocarpus. There's a longer story behind this. We, we stumbled upon it. We, tr we tried to um, ring the doorbell. We couldn't reach anyone. And um, in conversation with uh, one of our contacts, he told us, oh, I think I know the owner of that garden. And eventually through a friend of a friend of a friend, um, he was able to get in touch with the owner and the owner graciously allowed us to photograph the garden. 
uh, later on that day. So the, there's a sort of design axis to think about. On one end of the axis is the use of palms for their symbolism, for the power of the stories that they bring, the feelings that they generate, uh, sort of the stereotypes that they, that they um, support. You know, the tropical vacation, the desert oasis, um, the, those are some of the stereotypes that we, at least in California and perhaps the rest of the US, um, are used to with palms. Um, but palms are really effective design elements regardless of the stories and the feelings that they evoke. And so on the left, uh, a garden by Roger Raich in the, red country, uh, the Redwood Forest of Northern California uses palms and succulents and deciduous trees and shrubs and conifers um, all together as if they were paints in a palette and he was creating a, a scene without a tremendous regard for the backstories on the individual plants. He's not saying to us, this is a tropical garden or this is a redwood forest, or this is a Japanese garden. None of those things is he saying. He's saying, I can create an individual uh, special thing, a, 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 a living sculpture, a living painting, using whatever plants I want, as long as they grow well together. Um, and they, of course, look beautiful together. On the right, we are looking at a garden in the East Bay of San Francisco that, uh, of the San Francisco Bay Area, excuse me, um, that draws in uh, the images uh, that the palms provoke or evoke. So uh, the architectural element in the foreground is a screen door from Morocco. And in the background, we're looking at a Palo Verde tree, um, a Parkinsonia, and then a Brahea Clara palm, uh, both of which are sort of exotic desert species that perhaps you might find in a, in a garden in Marrakesh. Uh, and so this, this gardener, this homeowner, um, is using the palm to signify uh, and to, to evoke a feeling that she enjoys. So that's sort of the other end of that axis of design. And here's an image that, uh, I don't know if it defies that axis, but I think of this as a surreal uh, experience of, of uh, design with palms. This is a simple ficus uh, microcarpa hedge with um, multiple plantings of Camerops humilis, the Mediterranean fan palm, and then a, a foreground of some of Dio's condom tomb. It runs for the block, the anemonic of the Vice Hotel, uh, designed by Wurstler. I just, when we saw this, I had to get a photograph of it because there's something just so witty and, and delightful about it. And it, it's almost like these, you know, the simplicity of the hedge broken by the explosive energy and Kind of winsome personality of these little Mediterranean fan palm stems. Functionally, uh, palms can actually add something to things that we think of as, as sort of already decided functions in the garden. Um, in Charleston, we found this uh, podocarpus hedge enhanced by um, these tall, taller uh, palmettos, sable palmetto. I think what's happening here is we're getting a, a good strong uh, screen, a, a total blocking down below, and then we're getting a, a kind of uh, animated distraction up above. And the house beyond is able to enjoy some privacy and also enjoy the light that comes in over the hedge. I, I thought this was a super clever use of palms that I had rarely seen anywhere else. And of course that, that transition from uh, rosette to tree um, is an important thing to consider when we are planting our palms and choosing the spaces uh, where we're going to put them. This is um, Flora Grubbs Garden in Berkeley, California. Um, the image on the right is an earlier image uh, when she planted a uh, Brahea Clara uh, from a 36 inch box. It was a, a rosette at that point and she pruned up some of the lower leaves so that she could get in around the palm to garden. On the left, the garden has grown a bit. It's, it's established its trunk. It's got about four feet of trunk at this point. Um, and she was able to put in a little tiny lawn underneath, some chair, enjoy the sounds of the leaves above and the, the shade and the sense of comfort that that canopy provides. And of course, there's more room to plant underneath. So it expands the creative possibilities. This is a rather small garden, but this is a nice, big, beautiful element that actually makes the garden feel bigger because of the large scale of the leaves and the crown. 
So here at the San Francisco Botanical Garden, uh, we're seeing the rosettes of Jubea chilensis, the Chilean wine palm. Um, this planting is a little akin to the one I showed you from the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden. Um, it has the simpler rosettes of bromeliads in the foreground, in this case, terrestrial bromeliads from Chile in the genus Puya. Um, and then it's got the, the parallelism, the, the sort of Venetian blind effect on, a, on an arching rachis of the uh, Jubea rosettes. And then the, the much more irregular and jagged uh, silhouette of the Monterey cypress in the distance and the eucalyptus toward the left. And of course, these are going to grow up and they're going to produce their trunks and they're going to make space under them, but they're also going to draw the eye upward. Uh, this is the blue garden at Lotus Land um, in Santa Barbara, where Madame Ganovalska, the, the creator of, of Lotus Land, um, chose plants to create a blue garden. <laughs> in other words, she wasn't, she wasn't saying I'm creating a dry garden or I'm creating a, um, you know, a any other kind of stereotype garden. Um, she was creating a blue garden and so she, she chose blue plants and she, she had a, a flair and a, and a flamboyance uh, and was drawn to these really showy, attractive, um, exotic looking plants. And so she brought in these agave francisinii, which are quite large and, and very blue and silvery. Uh, and then of course the, the established jubeas, the Chilean wine palms that had actually been planted by one of the earlier owners of the estate. Uh, Braje Armada, the Mexican, what we call the Mexican blue palm that's native to northern Baja California. Um, and then the blue atlas cedar native to the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and Algeria. In the distance, that beautifully branched tree is the coast live oak, which is the signature tree of the coastal zone of California running from northern Baja California up to the wine country north of San Francisco. And with the low water needs of, of all of these different plants, um, that native tree is, is able to thrive. Another consideration for the use of palms in the landscape is what's gonna happen to them over time. Of course, most palms are, are just, if it's a palm tree, they're just gonna keep going up and up and up. Uh, they may slow down in their vertical development, but but that's sort of the, the story of most palm trees. But of course, with caryotas and, and some other closely related uh, members of the, of the family, we have to think about what's gonna happen to that tree once it starts to bloom and set fruit and then die because um, they are hapaxanthic or what we sometimes think of as monocarpic. They, they bloom and they die. So you have to sort of budget for the removal of these large elements in the landscape. Uh, the tree on the left, the Caryota obtusa or Caryota gigas um, at Hale Mahalu actually recently started to bloom and had to be removed. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it, it can be a costly, laborious process, but, but it's worth it for, for some people to have that extraordinary uh, bipinnate folia and just there's nothing like it. It almost looks pretty firm. And on the right, a, a photograph of a Caryota urens Himalayan variety um, at the San Francisco Botanical Garden in the process of blooming. Um, it's, it's down to just a bunch of inflorescences and decaying foliage at this point, and infructescences as well. Uh, just so for my part, I, I'm thrilled to see that um, in the San Francisco area, palms are being used more frequently. Um, in some very high profile projects, I was lucky enough to go on the 2018 biennial and see in habitat the tallest palm in the world, Siroxalon quindioense, um, at Tochisito Valley, where I took these photographs. These are not Caitlin's work, they're not nearly good enough. Um, in any case, it's exciting to see that there is some uh, awareness that palms don't have to be uh, symbolic of the tropics or symbolic of an oasis or whatever else. Um, they can just be really beautiful elements in a, in a landscape. And here another species that is very useful for us in the very cool, uh, mild climate of San Francisco, Parajabea cocoides, photographed at the Bogota Botanical Garden in 2018. And here they are in Oakland at the lakeside.
more Ciroc salon photos from Bogota, uh, an alley of Ciroc salon, Kindi and the National Columbia, um, up to the um, the uh, Montserrat Shrine in um, in Bogota, um, and then on the left at the Bogota Botanical Garden plantings of Ciroxalon and uh, some other palm species as well. And here in San Francisco at the uh, San Francisco Botanical Garden, you can see the development of the Ciroxalons uh, planted in 1984, I believe, uh, originally collected by Garen Fullington, who was one of my palm mentors, uh, recently departed, sadly. And again, uh, some of the that are used in California, so in some of the mild client people um, tend to garden uh, the Ropalus stylus bowerai from Norfolk Island, Ropalus stylus sapita, again, the Nikau palm on the right. Although actually, you know what? That one on the right is also bowerai, I'm sorry. Um, the, the photograph on the right is taken at the San Francisco Botanical Garden. On the left, the photograph is from the um, Santa Barbara Courthouse. And the palm in the foreground, that sort of sinuous trunk coming up, is a Phoenix Reclinata, as is, I believe, the, the left rosette. A little sight for, uh, for you who haven't been to the San Francisco Botanical Garden. Um, again, a grove of Nikau planted originally by Scott Medbury, one of the directors, um, a couple of uh, years ago. These are probably 15 or 20 years in the ground. More images uh, in the San Francisco Botanical Garden, flowers of the Nikau palm emerging. And then the silver Mediterranean fan palm, another useful palm. This one, much more versatile than the Nikau. I saw a beautiful specimen of this at the Lion Arboretum on Oahu near Honolulu in Hawaii, uh, growing in a really, you know, it's, it's a very wet area up there in the mountains above Honolulu. And this just looked perfect, despite its origins in a rather dry um, mountain setting in Morocco. Um, the color contributed by this palm is not just silver, it's also red and chartreuse in the flowers. And then some more uh, palms that are uh, increasingly seen around um, California's Mediterranean landscape. Um, again, the Chilean wine palm, and on the right, the um, Budia Jubea hybrid uh, at Dick Douglas's garden in Walnut Creek, California. If you look underneath the crown, you can see a nice big specimen of a Trithrinax campestris. Dick started the garden in um, 1975, I believe. Uh, and again, he has also departed, sadly. And he was another wonderful palm resource for me. Palms can even be used in rather cold climates um, beyond the Mediterranean or um, sort of subtropical areas, but actual temperate areas. On the left, the native needle palm of the Southeast United States, Rapidophyllum hystrix, also useful down in the tropics, or at least in the subtropics of Florida, um, but a good foliage plant and incredibly cold hardy. Um, as we know, it can be grown where uh, winters get rather snowy and cold. Uh, on the right, the Trachycarpus fortunii with a Rapidophyllum in the distance. This garden on the right is Mary Alice Woodrum's beautiful, beautiful garden in North Augusta, South Carolina, um, which is really at the outer edge of um, palm viability. These, these palms don't get damaged much, uh, if at all, but um, her native sable, sable palmetto gets damaged, Washingtonia gets damaged, um, because it gets quite cold in the winter. And, but she's able to compose this quite beautiful garden um, with different conifers, deciduous trees, evergreen trees, perennials, succulents, cactus, etc. Again, Trachycarpus princeps, perhaps the most attractive member of the dozen or so species in the genus. Trachycarpus wagnerianus, which is a cultivar of Trachycarpus fortunii with a, a tight sculptural leaf. Again, quite cold hardy, cherished in the Pacific Northwest of North America, uh, useful in Japan, seen all over Tokyo, um, and uh, uh, quite a nice palm for 
California as well. This is Mary Alice of Woodrum's Garden in North Augusta, South Carolina, uh, to give you a sense for the feeling of that, of that landscape and, and the use that the palms have. So this is a really great example of palms not taking center stage. Uh, palms are not the story of this garden. It's a garden composed of many different kinds of plants and trees uh, with palms as accents and uh, little focal points uh, here and there. She uses the humble sable miner, the native uh, ground dwelling sable from South Carolina, as well as Florida and uh, all the way over to Mississippi, I believe. Actually, no, I'm sorry, all the way over to Oklahoma and Arkansas and East Texas. <laughs> um, and then on the left, a water feature at Mary Alice's garden um, with a, some trachycarpus sort of up above, increasing that vertical experience. This is Edith Bergstrom's garden where she composes again the way that Roger Raich does with whatever plants she loves that grow well together, that look good together. Um, plants as paints in a palette. So uh, the columnar cactus is Echinopsis spatiana. The palm on the right is a supposedly a Budia odorata. I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then in the distance, you can see Livestona decora, the ribbon palm, which is uh, really an exquisite, fast growing and a surprisingly cold hardy palm. Uh, and then in the mid-ground, those fan palms are uh, Brahea, I believe, Iliata. All the possible, uh, especially with hardy palms, but I think the lessons that we learned on our travels through Florida, Hawaii, South Carolina, Georgia, and California uh, can inform people all around the world, whether you're in a tropical place, a subtropical place, or a mild temperate zone like a Mediterranean climate. Thanks so much for your time, and uh, I would love to talk further over Q&A. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Um, very much appreciated. Uh, are you able to see the Q&A? There have been a few questions coming in. I am opening up. I see answered questions. You can look at so, some of those had to deal with uh, IPS, but others, uh, some folks have been using the chat function as well, but. Okay, I'll look in the chat function. Okay. And you can unscreen, unshare your screen at this point as well. If you okay, uh, pause share, right? Stop yeah. share, great. There you go. Okay. Perfect. Okie doke. Um, do you want to read out questions or shall I? Uh, why don't you pick the ones that are, are most related to, to what you're uh, speaking on. Some are IPS questions, so. Right. Um, well, here, let me read you one from Jason in Brazil. Um, uh -huh. have, you, have you ever used palm trees native to Brazil or South American regions for landscaping? I noticed the Socratea exoriza is widely used. Do you know any potential species for use, thanks. Um, well, here in, in California, the um, Cyagoras romanzofiana is everywhere. It's probably the second or third most popular um, planted palm, so from southern Brazil. Um, and then Budia odorata from southern Brazil as well is extremely popular. Well, no, that's not true. <laughs> is moderately popular in southern California and um, unfortunately not well enough known in Northern California. It's actually better suited um, than many of the palms that are popular in Northern California. Those are the two main um, Brazilian palms that we see. My company is growing other Brazilian palms. We have Cyagris Wedeliana, um, which we are selling right now, uh, small size. Um, we've sold Alligopter arenaria in the past. Uh, Trithrinex, um, I believe Acanthacoma is native to Brazil. Um, so we, we have Trithrinex Acanthacoma in production and that has been a popular palm in the past when we've been able to offer it. Excellent, thanks. Uh, 
Uh, you can scroll through the chats. Most of the chats were observations or comments on the photos. I'm not seeing a lot of questions. Um, the latest question I see from laramat128 at Gmail. Um, I'm seeing a, a fair number of carpoxylon uh, in Florida and Hawaii as well. It seems seems to be starting to get out there. Um, and it's it's really beautiful, dramatic plant. And I, I hear from the folks that, um, you know, I've, I've talked to in those areas that it's pretty easy. It's not that, it's not a hard grow, as long as it's, you know, getting sufficient moisture and not too much, not, not too much cold. Um, Mark Rule asks, where is my book available? Um, you can get it on bookshop.org. You can get it on uh, Amazon. Um, and uh, you can get it, if you go to Timber Press, uh, Tim, I believe it's timberpress.com, you can also uh, purchase it directly, I believe, from the publisher. And then uh, Roberto Obregón in the chat section uh, posted something there. You see that? Uh, I can read it. Thank you for your presentation. I'm from Sonora, Mexico. A lot of local people like to skin the Washingtonia robusta trunk. Personally, I like native. What is the damage in that skinless trunk? Uh, just like the photos of the terrace from San Francisco you showed. I assume that's removing the boots. Is that, am yeah. I understanding that correctly? Um, so at our uh, wholesale nursery in San Diego, um, we take orders for Washingtonias all the time. We have to always ask, do you want the natural trunk or do you want the skinned trunk? Um, when we skin the trees, we, we stop pruning the leaf bases below the crown about two or three um, feet below the crown. Uh, if you get higher than that on the, on the trunk, um, you start to damage the, the tree and the trunk. Uh, it's, not, it's not good for the Washingtonia. However, we also take similar requests for the Trachycarpus fortunii, um, which you probably don't see down in, in um, Sonora, but the Trachycarpus fortunii can be pruned all the way up to the lowest green leaf, um, and you can skin the leaf bases off. Uh, so it depends on the, on the species, but, but Washingtonia, you have to be careful. You don't wanna, you don't wanna prune too high on the trunk. Um, and, and by pruning, I mean to cut along the line where the leaf base encircles the trunk to reveal the surface of the trunk. So skinning, that's what skinning refers to. Um, yeah. And Robert, I don't actually see that. So I'm wondering which, oh, was it in the Q&A section? That yeah, one? he was in the Q&A. There's another one over in q and I'm kind of using both of them now. I'm looking at both. Uh, does your book cover how to design the structure of larger acreage type palmetum garden, i.e. paths, using paths, etc.? And this is from Jonathan Haycock. Uh, to some extent it does. Um, it's, uh, it's much more about planting design, but it offers examples um, for the, the benefits to, for example, uh, creating prospects and open spaces um, you know, in a, in a densely planted palm garden so that you can appreciate some of the palm specimens that you have. And uh, there's one image in particular that I think of from uh, Punta Roquina where a path, a, a kind of a wandering path goes between Tycho Sperma elegans trunks. And it's a particularly appealing um, effect because you're, you're sort of walking through this open space with these posts, these thin trunks um, as a, not, not an obstacle course so much as just a, a very open kind of coppice or, or grove. Um, it, it, that's one thought to, to offer, but there are so many, we, I write in the book about 14 individual gardens besides the chapters devoted to different themes that palms can support and different aesthetic effects that they can confer. Uh, and so within those three chapters particularly, uh, there's a wealth of different design ideas, uh, including space, spatial design. Um, Keith Santner asks, is Brahe Armada well adapted to the Bay Area? 
Um, the answer to that is that away from the coast, yes, it is well adapted. On the coast, it's extremely slow growing and uh, it tends to get uh, fungal diseases on the lower leaves, although it doesn't, those fungal diseases don't appear to kill them. <laughs> um, so they, I would say, you know, if I have a customer in San Francisco who wants to grow a Brahe Armada, and we do sell it, um, I, I ask them whether they are able to give it full sun, whether they are able to give it really good drainage, and in such cases where they can, then I, I'm perfectly comfortable selling that, that palm to them. Um, it's very cold hardy, and it's also extremely drought tolerant. Um, and so it's a sort of palm in California that you can plant and, and after a couple of years just stop irrigating um, if you're not out in the desert. Um, and even in the desert, you could probably get away with that a little bit. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite well adapted. Uh, pretty far north in, in the inland parts of California up to Redding. Um, and then essentially if you're within, if you're, if you're outside of about six or 10 kilometers from the ocean or maybe four, four miles from the ocean, it's a, it's a pretty good bet. Um, and Nicholas Quinn asks, what is the name of your nursery in Fallbrook and where is it located? Um, the nursery is called Grub and Nadler uh, Nurseries. It's in Rainbow um, and it's on Rainbow Valley Boulevard. So if you look up Grub, G-R-U-B-B, -B, and Nadler, N-A-D-L-E-R, uh, you will find our website with lots of photos and we sell lots of succulents and other, other plants. Um, Sung Jun asks, what the best place to grow as many species as possible in the USA is. Uh, the Big Island of Hawaii or other islands in Hawaii is the answer. <laughs> um, Hawaii has a very mild tropical climate uh, and microclimates abound and you choose your location and you get a particular microclimate that enables you to grow whichever wide variety of palms you want. <laughs> and uh, you know the only exception is it's it's not easy to find plantable properties in Hawaii where growing cool growing palms is easy. Uh, there are a few higher altitude towns in Hawaii but not that many. Most of the most of the places you can grow in Hawaii are lowland and like warmer um, you know weather. Um, And then there are a couple of questions that popped up over on chat, so if you want to take a okay. look at I'm a beginner and a number of the palms I have transplanted six months ago tend to be brown and dry at the leaf tips, and they also tend to more yellow than deep green. Any quick suggestion for here in coastal Puerto Rico? I find, this is from Mark Rule or Roule, I'm not sure. Um, I find that palms definitely go through different symptoms of shock upon transplanting. And one of the common most symptoms is um, they, they show net, uh, nutrient deficiencies on the older leaves after planting. And in some cases, uh, for example, a friend just planted an Acantha phoenix crinita, even the new growth will go through a, um, what appears to be a kind of nutrient deficiency after transplanting. Um, and then the drying of the leaf tips has probably more to do with just the loss of root mass um, or the damage to roots upon planting. In California, um, I recommend to people not to manipulate the root ball of a palm. If they're getting a palm out of a container, it's best to maintain the root ball when planting because um, it, the new roots will grow into that root ball and out of the root ball beyond into the native soil, the local soil. Um, in, uh, you know, it, it, it might not necessarily be the right answer for other climates and other soil areas, but certainly, and I can't speak to coastal Puerto Rico, but it would make sense to me to follow that advice um, in, in a tropical location like coastal Puerto Rico. Um, also, if you are on the coast, directly on the coast, then certain palms are not going to tolerate the trade wind and salt air uh, situation. Um, so I've seen, for example, a, t a palm that we think of as very tough, um, the Bismarckian nobilis, 
getting really sort of ragged and dried out uh, with dried leaf tips in uh, the, the windiest windward side of Kauai, which is a climate not terribly different from Puerto Rico, probably a little cooler, but uh, and maybe a little wetter. But nonetheless, some of these really exposed windward areas can, can subject palms to stresses that they're not used to. Um, and then a question from Lara Matt, uh, or Lara Matt 128 uh, at Gmail. Sorry, just to revisit the second part of my previous question, where in a garden do joey palms have a place and how would you use them? Thank you. So joey palms are um, extraordinary foliage plants and I would use them in a semi-shaded area where you have perhaps a higher canopy. You wouldn't want those extraordinarily beautiful uh, entire leaves to get interrupted by other foliage coming down from above or from the side. Um, and I would try to use maybe at least three at a time or two or three. Um, although, you know, if you've only got one, it's, it's an exquisite thing to have. So um, yeah, and that, that's, that's the main advice I would say about a joy palm. They will eventually form a trunk, but it takes quite a long time and the trunk doesn't go up very fast. Um, ah, I see Mark Rule mentions that he's a thousand feet away from the coast. So species selection is gonna be really important there. Um, and so using some of the Coco Thrinax, uh, the Pseudo Phoenix, um, obviously coconut, um, those are gonna be good bets for you uh, for palms right by the coast, uh, especially if you're on the windward side. But I suspect any side, if you're that close to the ocean is a place where you're gonna choose plants adapted to a coastal setting. You know, a plant that I don't see that much in gardens, it's so beautiful, is um, Allegoptera arenaria, the palm native to the coastal dunes of um, eastern Brazil. It's a beautiful, beautiful foliage plant. It also produces really pretty inflorescences and edible fruit. Um, that's a, if I had a, if I had a sandy soil on a tropical coastline, I would plant tons of that palm. I think it's exquisite. Um, Serenoa repens from the southeast U.S. is a great coastal palm. Um, some of the sables are good coastal palms, uh, sable palmetto for one. Um, probably, I'm, I, I can't speak to it, but I suspect sable caziarum, your, your native uh, Puerto Rican sable, is a good one. Uh, but I'd have to rely on, on local experts on that one. And then Jason, why don't we wrap up with Martin's question over in uh, the chat section? We'll take uh, one more question and then we should probably, running a bit over here, we should probably start wrapping things up. Martin Ferris, I live in San Angelo, Texas. We have gotten down to 10 degrees several times since I started my collection of palms in 2007. Brahe Armada has never been damaged here. Not unusual for us to stay below freezing for four or five days straight. I actually grow nine species of brahea and 60 species total outdoors, completely unprotected. So I love this kind of information. This is the best. So brahea armada comes from uh, canyons on the east side of the mountain range in northern Baja California. It's a really hot, extremely dry desert. And they grow in the same habitat as the Washingtonia filifera, which is known to be one of the more cold hardy tree palms. Um, they happen to grow a little higher up away from the water courses than the Washingtonia filifera do. And um, it's a pretty extreme environment. And you can imagine some of these mountains get all the way up to about 10,000 feet above sea level. Um, and the, the canyons down below draw cold air from those higher altitudes. And I wouldn't be surprised if in habitat, the uh, temperatures drop down into the 20s uh, infrequently, but, but once in a, in a blue moon. And these, these two native palm species, the Brahe Armada and the Brahe, I'm sorry, the Washingtonia filifera would have to endure pretty low temperatures in habitat from infrequent cold snaps. Um, that I don't think they reach above about 3000 feet in altitude themselves, but it's that drainage of cold air from the higher altitudes that is probably responsible for the, the inherent hardiness of those Brahe Armada. Now, as for the other Brahea species, I mean, it, it's um, perhaps just genetic heritage that it allows them to be so cold hardy. And the same is probably true for some of the sable species. It's known that sable caziarum and sable domingensis both have different kinds of cold hardiness. 
uh, that would be surprising given that their habitats are totally tropical, or at least, you know, Cosiarum especially, because it's a low altitude species. Um, so you might want to look into some of those sables that you might not already have. Um, but boy, 10 degrees, that's impressive with no damage. It's great, great to hear. I think your heat also helps and the, um, the variability of your winter. So you might have a, an outbreak of four or five days below freezing, but then within a, a couple of weeks, you're also going to probably see temperatures back up at 20 degrees Celsius, say 68 degrees Fahrenheit, or even higher. Um, I, I, I can't vouch for that, but that's what I've seen watching the weather um, where, you know, the continental masses blow out over Texas and then the, some of the tropical moisture comes back in and warms things up again. Um, and Robert, did you want to uh, oh, do any last questions or should we wrap up? Uh, I'm no, happy to yeah, knock off those last two in, in chat. Okay. We'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, uh, Sunjun says, thanks for your reply. Okay, Hawaii is where Jeff and Suchin Marcus's garden is, and he does have amazing collection of garden. But how about mainland USA, such as San Diego, Florida? So uh, mainland USA, you're probably your best place to be growing palms is um, so South Florida, uh, Southeast Florida, Southwest Florida, but particularly Southeast Florida. So anywhere from Palm Beach down to the Florida Keys. And then the Florida Keys themselves uh, will give you a truly tropical climate below, um, you know, a certain midpoint on the, on the Keys. Um, they have drier weather. I mean, it doesn't rain as much in the Keys. And, uh, and the soils are, are less, unfor you know, they're, they're unforgiving. They're, they're extremely alkaline um, limestone soils. So... I would say Broward County is, is a good one because it's sort of in between the, but there are these very interesting kind of micro climates as you go up along the East Coast of South Florida. Um, San Diego is great. Uh, Orange County is particularly nice. I mean, there's some really favored spots in, in uh, LA as well, Los Angeles. Um, but when, when what I would say as a Californian, your microclimate is is important. So once you get down into those coastal Southern California areas, um, you, you have to pay close attention to the topography and the uh, experience of other gardeners in those areas. Um, but certain areas right along the coast can be completely frost free. And, um, and if you're lucky, they can accumulate a little more heat than some of the other areas. The coastline is cooler than the inland areas of South Florida. Uh, Federico, Karnatsa says, many thanks for the lovely conversation. Could you please spend a few words about the state of art of RPW and palm moth control, which are continuing their palms destruction in the Mediterranean area? Thanks. This is something I don't know anything about in the Mediterranean. I can tell you that in Southern California, <clears throat> the South American uh, palm weevil has uh, entered Southern San Diego County and is progressing northward and is devouring Canary Island date palms in particular and poses a threat probably to uh, other palm trees or other palms in, in California. Um, and the quarantine, well, there hasn't really been much of a quarantine. The, the uh, you know, the real economic interest there is the date palm groves in the Coachella Valley and to a lesser extent, Arizona and um, the Imperial Valley of California. And that economic interest is really going to be what drives the uh, agricultural control and the pest control in California. The ornamental economic impact is going to be huge and is already starting to, to add up, unfortunately. Um, but unfortunately, I can't tell you about the red palm weevil in the Mediterranean. I, I've not been to the Mediterranean since I uh, started working on the book. And, um, and I'm not in touch with, with any experts in the Mediterranean basin about has control there, unfortunately, but I hear it's a sad situation, and um, and I I hope that that same situation doesn't arise in in California from this South South American uh, palm weevil. Um, it apparently it has taken out all of the Canary or most of the Canary Island date palms in Tijuana, uh, in Mexico, northernmost Baja California on the border with San Diego County. Uh, and then I think one last chat down yep. here about some local um, 
questions. I guess I'm not understanding, so sorry. Um, Nikki Sanders, okay, Santa Monica better than Central LA then? My brother lives a few steps from the three Jubea chalenses that grow in front of LACMA. Um, so mainly in terms of microclimates in Los Angeles, if you're on a slope and um, especially if you're south of the Santa Monica Mountains, um, you've got a really enviable climate. Um, Hollywood Hills, uh, Beverly Hills, um, uh, Los Feliz Hills, uh, Silver Lake, uh, Echo Park. These are very warm areas with really good cold drainage and urban heat island effect. Um, so you can really grow remarkable, a remarkable range of, of palms in those areas. Um, I've seen vichias looking decent. I've seen, you know, there are lots of plumerias thriving in that area. Um, mangoes fruit well over there. Um, and then, so Santa Monica better than Central LA. Santa Monica is milder, so it's probably less subject to frost. But as you go farther on the flats of LA, away from the ocean, you get more frost. Uh, but it's not a lot. It's rare. It's extremely rare. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's all I can offer. Excellent. Jason, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, um, especially for these questions. I think people have uh, gained enormously from your commentary. Remind us all where to get your book. Uh, well, you can get my book at um, bookshop.org, uh, Designing with Palms, and uh, it's Jason DeWeese, D-E-W-E-E-S. You can also go to Amazon, uh, again, Designing with Palms, um, and you can also go to timberpress.com um, or just Google Timber Press Designing with Palms. Even if you just uh, Google Designing with Palms, you will find a website from Timber Press with information about it. Um, and you can buy from them, you can buy from Amazon, you can buy from Bookshop. Uh, you, can, you can order it from your local store through bookshop.org, which is one of the reasons I, I like to plug it because if you do have a local bookstore that you wanna support, um, that's one way to do it, is to order through bookshop.org. Fantastic. I'm hoping we can uh, invite you for a second appearance as your work progresses and evolves. And once again, thank you all. But thank you for your time and your, your generous, your ability and willingness to share with everybody. And for all the participants, remember, uh, the recording will be available at www.palms.org. And uh, don't forget to join or renew your membership in the International Palm Society. And keep, uh, keep your eyes open for follow on. We hope to have a, a robust series of webinars to follow. And once again, thank you for everyone's indulgence in terms of the, the technical issues. But uh, you know, like all, we're suffering a few teething pains, but I think it was absolutely well worth the wait. Wait, thank you everyone, appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thanks so much, Robert. <laughs> See you.